Um, I know that some of you might have built a few queries before. Some of you are probably newbies to this. So we're going to start with a 30,000 foot view. We're going to start with uh, why do we want to do queries? What's the, what's the end goal with all this stuff? And then we're going to talk about the anatomy of queries. Um, but as we get down into this agenda, we're going to actually hear from Jeff on some specific examples that they've worked on in their, in their organization. And then um, last but not least, I'm going to leave you with a lot of query templates. So a lot of you are creating uh, some queries out there, you're creating dashboards, you're creating some alerts. What we want to show you today is some, some, um, some queries that are really easily portable from one environment to another. Um, and the good news is that all these are found in our community environment, which is called Sumo Dojo. So I'm going to show you not only uh, the queries themselves, but also how to find more of those uh, for, for the future. All right, so with that said, let's, uh, let me give you the 30,000 foot view of what, um, just to kind of give context in here. So, uh, the, the way that data flows into Sumo Logic, we break it into three main areas. Data collection, which is the first area here, and we're assuming that uh, for everybody here on this call, the data is already in the system. So we do this through collectors and sources. Where we're going to be spending most of the time today is a little area called search and analyze. So how do we take that data? How do we start searching? How do we analyze? How we use? How do we use the Sumo Logic operators to get the most out of our data and be able to um, identify the critical events or identify trends or identify outliers. We're not going to cover too much around dashboards and alerts. Um, as a matter of fact, at the end, I'll probably point you to some good resources on that. But the main focus today is on how to create these queries, how to write queries in, uh, in Sumo Logic. So the question is, why queries? Well, the reason is because queries become the building blocks to be able to analyze your data, to be able to monitor and visualize your data, and at the end of the day, to alert. So you create queries that allow you to troubleshoot or identify trends or identify outliers. Um, you're also going to be using queries to then also to, to create dashboards so you can monitor your data. And last but not least, you're going to use queries to create alerts that can provide you notification of all your critical events. So. I'm going to show you today how to cook these queries, how to go from scratch and build them. But here's the really cool thing. You don't have to start from scratch. I want to take like two minutes to tell you about the Sumo Logic apps. And what are Sumo Logic apps? These are out-of-the-box content for a lot of the popular sources that are out there. It's pre-built queries that you can start using as templates. So I'm going to switch over to my instance here. This is just a uh, generic training instance that probably many of you have seen in my previous videos. And what I wanted to show you is some content for, in this case, Apache, Apache Access Data. And here's the really cool thing. I installed these this morning. I have done absolutely nothing other than point them to my data. And the really cool thing is my data starts flowing into these dashboards and all these uh, lights start going off because all the data is flowing and we understand Apache data. So we know how to parse it and how to take that data. So I'm kind of showing you the cooked turkey, if you will, how to how to take that recipe and cook that turkey. This is the end product. And what we're going to be doing in the next hour is showing you how to cook that product. The really cool thing for all you guys is that all these queries that you see here, behind each one of these panels, there is an actual query. So if I were to click on one of these, for example, that one on the top right, it takes me back to the query area. And there it is. This is the query itself. For, uh, for that panel that was put together. The great news for me and for you and for everybody on this call is that I can always take that query as a template and I can reuse it as I, um, however I need. So I can go in here and say, perhaps I don't want a time slice by five minutes, I want a time slice by 10 minutes. I can rerun that query and, um, and I, can, I can rerun that query with 10 minutes time slices. And if, and if I really want to, I can even dashboard with my new query that I ran. So the good news for you is today I'm going to show you how to build a lot of these queries, um, but there are queries already built in a lot of these apps that are available to you. And if you're wondering which apps are available and how do I get to them, you go into library, you click on apps, and these are all the different apps that are available to you. Um, you can go and install any of these. For example, I could take my um, Artifactory stuff here. I can click on install, and all these dashboards would get installed, and my data would start flowing into them. All right, so um, I'm going to close a couple of tabs in here to keep it clean, um, but but keep in mind that, that here's an artifactory dashboard that I set up for um, for my um, from from the apps themselves, and I think I have a couple of screenshots here for AWS CloudTrail. This is yet another dashboard that comes from apps. So I'm going to I'm showing you the uh, the cooked turkey, which has a lot of templates for you to use, but 
let's go back to basics. Let's start with searching itself. And I, what I want to walk you through today is the anatomy of a query itself. So for those of you who have a little bit of experience, you probably have done a few queries, but for those of you who have not, and you find yourself, let's say on this screen, um, let me just go back to, to, the, to that search screen. Um, you're probably finding yourself with this screen in a blank uh, bar in here. You could do anything. I could type the word error and hit on enter. And what this is doing is it's searching for the word error across all my data for the last 15 minutes. And it's coming back with a whole bunch of messages. In this case, they're coming from my Apache error data, but I can see the, all the messages that are coming in here. This is not the smartest of queries, but at least you start understanding how you can put a keyword in here and search for that. The histogram I have in the middle is showing me the number of messages I've gotten every minute for this last 15 minutes that I, that I search for, and I can see my results down here at the bottom. Pretty straightforward. Let's get to more advanced stuff. Let me uh, skip a couple of these uh, slides, which I'm going to share with you along with the recording once, uh, once the session is over. Let's talk a little bit about the structure of the search. So the way that a search is put together is we want you to search with meta, what we call a metadata tag. And these are tags that get added to every single message that comes into the system. And we'll definitely talk a little more about that. You can specify some keywords, and then you can start parsing out that data so you can extract meaningful, um, me meaningful fields out of the data so that then you can start doing something with that data. So here's, for example, um, my search against uh, my data who's been tagged with source category equals Apache access. So that's my metadata. And I have a keyword of blog. So I really only care for all those messages that, um, that hit my blog page. Then I'm parsing that source IP and I'm saying I want the IP addresses that do not match 46 and that not is that bang right in front of it, right? Then I count by source IP, I do a sorting and I limit it by 10, 10 users. So let me, let me grab this example and drop it into our instance so that you can see how that, is, how that works. Fortunately for me, I had done that earlier and here is my query itself. If I run start for the last 15 minutes, this is what the results look like. Here are my different source IPs. And if you remember, these are the top 10 IP addresses because I did a limit by 10. And I can see a count. This is the IP with the most hits and so on. To give you a better idea of how this was done, let me comment out some of these messages. And this is very similar to other programming languages that you're seeing. I just put two slashes in front of it. Uh, to forward slashes and that comments it out. So if I were to just run the first line, give me everything uh, that you have for source category equals Apache access and that it includes the word blog, that's what I get. I get 394 messages. There's the word blog and it's coming from my Apache access. Pretty straightforward. I can then start parsing that data, meaning extract some meaningful fields. And what this says is find this pattern. And when you find that pattern, meaning something and then dash dash and then an open bracket, extract that field and store it in a new field called source IP. And that's exactly what it's doing. If you notice, it found this pattern, which is right here. I'm gonna highlight it for you. And then it said, okay, I'm gonna extract that IP address and I'm gonna store it in a new field card source IP. So I hope this walkthrough is, is giving you a good idea of what each one of these lines is doing. Then I go, I take it a step further and say, now that you know what the source IP looks like, I want you to exclude anything that starts with a 46. So I'm taking a subnet of my source IPs and I don't really care about those. I take those out. And then I could say, now I want you to count by source IP. So here's all my source IPs, here's the counts, and you get the last two. I can sort by them and eventually I can just show the top 10 of those uh, sorted IPs. So that's my end result. I can see a count by source IPs. And with this information, I can start plotting it. I can put some lines, I can put some graphs, and a little more about that later on. But the idea is I can take a very simple, uh, I, I can take a, a, a query and start adding um, additional operators to get the results that I want. So again, the syntax itself is metadata text plus keywords, then you parse so you can extract some fields, and then you're gonna do some sort of formatting or some sort of aggregation. So what I wanna do is, I want to walk you through each one of these. I'm going to walk you through what a metadata tag looks like, what keywords are available, what kind of parsing you can do, and then on top of that, um, what kind of um, we're going to give you some examples of what kinds of aggregation or formatting you can do with your data. Let's start with metadata fields. 
Um, every single message that comes into Sigma Logic gets tagged with at least these five fields. Collector is the name of the collector that it came through. Source is the name uh, of the, that the source was defined during your configuration of your collector. The source host is the name where the host the, so, the host name where the source exists. The source name is the name of the log file that this message came from, including the path. But the really important one is source category because this can be just about anything you want. So coming up with a good source category naming convention is, is a very, it's a key thing to do early on. Um, and we have other webinars for this, which I'd be happy to point you to for that. When it comes to keyword search, the keywords can be case insensitive, are case insensitive. We support wildcards. So if you do fail star, it's gonna find any messages that say fail, fails, failure. Uh, we can do Boolean logic, as you can imagine. And the key thing is that we want you to start combining your metadata fields with your keywords. So in this example, and here on the right-hand side, you see that I'm looking for anything, any source category that has Apache and anything that does not have a URL that ends with .gov. So I'm looking for anything that is .gov and I want to exclude it from here. So you notice I'm, I'm using Boolean logic, I'm using support of wildcards, and this is case insensitive, so I could write it however I want. All right, if you have any questions, by the way, feel free to send them through the chat. Uh, Maria is definitely looking up to, uh, looking out for any of those questions. We'd be happy to, uh, to respond to any of those. All right, so great. One of the key things we wanna keep in mind, and, and Jeff is certainly gonna talk a little more about this, is we definitely want you to start developing good search habits. For one, we want you to start, we, we definitely wanna use metadata and keyword combinations whenever possible because this reduces the scope of your search. And we have something in the back end called Bloom Filters. And for those geeky ones in the in the room like me, Bloom Filters allow you to search through data a lot quicker by identifying where things are not found. I can say you're, the data that you're looking for is not found in this large bucket and it's not, not found here. And I can zoom in into where it is. So metadata and keywords make your searches a lot easier. Also, you notice that I add line breaks after each operation. So if you look at my examples in here, I'm adding line breaks. Instead of having everything looking like this, which is harder to troubleshoot, it's harder to share, um, I'm adding line breaks by doing an Alt-Enter and, and putting the next operator in the next line, which makes it a lot easier to do. Plus, it also allows you to do things like comment out fields altogether, which for troubleshooting purposes, again, makes it a lot easier. The other thing I want to mention and this is a biggie, is you want to limit your result sets before doing any aggregation. So if you're aware of a big chunk of your data that you do not need, exclude it. Or if there's just certain data that you want to focus on, then just include that data. Because by doing that kind of stuff, you're going to make your queries run a lot faster. And the last thing I want to talk about is narrowing your time range as much as possible. So if you know that your data only happen within a five minute time frame, just look for those five minutes. There's no need to look for the entire day's worth of data. Speaking of time range, you have a few options in there. You can use the drill, uh, use the drop down, or you can use a relative notation like this one, or you can use an absolute notation. Let me show you that. If I'm here, I can look for 15 minutes worth of data, or I can look for 60 minutes worth of data. But what if I wanted 45 minutes in there? No problem, I can do minus 45 minutes. Or what if I wanted to do 15 minutes worth of data, but with a 30 minute offset? offset. I can say from minute 45 to minute 30. So you can do that kind of notation. Or what if I wanted to do data today I, uh, at 8 a.m.? I could just say 8 a.m. to 8.05 a.m. And you get the point, right? So with that in mind, let me just show you some examples here, minus 45. Uh, minutes, M is minutes, H is hours, D is days, or you can use absolute notation like I showed you before. This assumes that you're doing it for today. And if you want an absolute value and you have to specify year as well, you could do this kind of notation as well. All right, so the last, the second thing I mentioned was parsing your data, extracting fields out of your data. It's gonna be very important because that's how you're gonna be ending and end, end up using those fields so you can do something with them. The example that I showed you was using a parse anchor, which means there is something in your message, in my case, there is a, a dash dash in a, in a bracket that I can always find there so that I can use that as an anchor and say, find anything before that and use it. But every so often, you will not, you will not have it that easy. 
Well, the good news for all of you on, in, the, in the call is that you can use parse regex. Most of us have used regex in the past, and you can knock yourself silly using parse regex and getting all the nested information you want from your files. If you're sending us data in CSV format, we can do that, or in some other commas, uh, let's say, colon separated um, file, you can use split. If you're sending us your data in key value pairs, meaning name equals Mario, company equals Sumo Logic, then you can use our key value um, operator to parse that. And last but not least, if you have data in JSON format, we know what JSON looks like, so you can get your data in, in that way as well. All right. Um, I'm going to uh, go past the uh, go past the JSON extract and let's talk a little bit about parsing habit. Uh, I should say, like developing parsing habits. So, whenever possible, if you have a structured message, use parse anchor instead of parse regex. For one, it's going to make it a lot easier for you to build, but second, it performs a lot better. So, whenever possible, use parse anchor. Also, whenever possible, avoid using, if you're using parse regex, avoid using expenses, expense tokens like uh, dot star. Instead, be as specific as possible. If you're looking for a digit that is between two and 10 characters, then specify that. Say that, don't say, give me everything that is out there. I understand every so often you might end up having to use something like this, but whenever possible, avoid them. And last but not least, whenever you can, we want you to use what is called a field extraction rule. And this might be new for some of you. Um, what a field extraction rule is, it's a rule that allows us to extract fields at the time that the data is getting ingested. So let me show you one that I've built already for um, in my organization. So if I were to just grab, um, if I were to just search for source source category equals Apache Access, you'll see something pretty cool happen. Um, when I search source category of Apache Access, before I do any aggregation or any of that stuff, look over here in the left-hand side. There's a lot of fields that have already been parsed from this. For example, uh, this is my URL in here. This one in here is my status code. This one is the byte size. And all those fields, check it out, they've been parsed already. Here's my source IP. Here's my status code. Here's the URL. Here's the agents. How did these get parsed out if, I'm not if I don't have a parse statement in here? The reason for that is because someone, in this case it was me as well, but someone created a field extraction rule, in this case this one called Apache Access. Let me edit it so you can see that field. Um, this, this field extraction rule is saying whenever you have data that has a source category equals Apache Access, apply this parsing rule to it. In this case, it's using parse regex, but look at it. It's saying look for digits that are one to three followed by a period one to three followed by a period and you get the point and store that in a field called source ip find another pattern and store it in method store it in status code and that is how all those fields get parsed ahead of time so that i don't have to have a parsing statement every time i run a search which means that if i were searching this query i could simplify it with this why because my parsing statement already exists in my field extraction rules, and I can run this kind of query now without having to parse that field in there. Okay, great. So um, let's see if we have any questions out there. Feel free, Maria, to interrupt me if, if there are specific questions we want to go up to. So uh, field extraction rules eliminate having to parse on every query. Also, one thing I do want to point out, you probably have come across in our um, in our documentation with some public parsers. This was the old way of doing thing and, and things, and these public parsers will soon be deprecated. So whenever possible, change it to use a field extraction rule instead of using these public parsers. All right, pretty cool. So I've shown you a little bit of the anatomy of how things should be set up. What I wanna do is turn it over to Jeff now. And Jeff is going to show us some examples that he's actually been using on the field, um, specifically some examples that took queries that used to take a long time. And by doing a few minor changes, those queries are now um, uh, much easier to, to build. So Jeff, if you're online, I'd be more than happy to drive for you. So you tell me uh, when you want me to move to the next slide. All right. Thanks, Mario. That was fantastic. Yeah, go ahead and move to the next slide. So the first thing I wanted to show you guys is you know, the most common the most common mistake that we see people make with our customers is they'll come to us and they'll say, hey, yeah, these queries are really slow. We don't know what's going on. Uh, so I wanted to show you two really, really common mistakes. Uh, the first thing, if you're looking at on the, on the left-hand side here, what they did is they just took a string and they threw it in, and then they tried to parse out some stuff and, and go through an aggregation with the counts. That query took 
eight minutes and 59 seconds to do when I did it on my data, right? That is a, that is a really long time. Doing it on the exact same window, but actually using a source category, like, hey, I'm only looking for my Office 365 SharePoint data. I don't care where else that, you know, wherever else that particular string might exist. By adding in the source category, that query came back in one minute and 19 seconds. So we're going to show you some more examples of where we use different strings and, and metadata and keywords to make this stuff go faster. But it is, in, it is way faster to be using your metadata tags and source categories at the very beginning of the search, right? So that's what you want to do as, as often as you can. You go to the next slide. All right, so same thing, but this is another another common mistake that we see people make. One of the really cool things about Sumo Logic is that it does all the indexing of the strings, so we can use that to our advantage, right? If you look at the one on the left, we're just going to our source category, which any source category that has the word Zscaler in it, and then we're parsing out some stuff. But because you know a lot of us are old database people like me, right? Hey, where user ID equals this user ID. That used to be something we always had to do, right? Do a select statement and then pull it out because of the where. So that's a common mistake we see. That query took one minute and 19 seconds. If I move that user, because that's all I'm really looking for, right, is that user ID. If I move that into the string, so now it's a keyword, that query is only 30 seconds. So it goes a lot faster if I just move that all the way to the top. And this is probably the most common thing that we see. I've seen all these really incredible queries that people have built where they're just using the different where statements because they're really fantastic at SQL. And they forget that they can just take that data straight up into the keyword field and that query goes so much faster. All right, next, uh, next slide. So the other thing I want to show you is there's lots of different ways to do things in Sumo, which is what's so cool about it. Uh, you can do all kinds of different things in different ways and get the same results. And this is just one example that I wanted to point out to you guys. There's three different ways to limit your results when you're doing a query, right? So if you look at the, this particular query, it's a, it's a standard volume query. You can actually pull this one straight out of the query library in the community, right? And it's one we use at every single one of our customers because it tells us how much volume per source category uh, for each of our customers so we know exactly where their ingestion uh, levels are at. And the first one, if you just use the limit field, like limit 10, you also want to make sure that you're using the sort by field, right? So there's the sort by descending or ascending, so that way you can organize your data a little bit better. So the whole point, if you're using the limit, is to make sure that you've also got a sort and you've decided, do I want this to be ascending or, or descending? On the, uh, you can, in, to do the exact same thing, you can do a top, which has the, the exact same values as the uh, limit 10 sort by descending, but I'm just doing a top 10 view by the, the, the field that I want, which is gigabytes. Right? And then the last way you can do it with, the, another way to do it is you can do it with the accumulation field. So you can, that, that particular tag will take any number and accumulate it, and then you can just organize it by the rank order. So those are three different ways that you can actually get to the same exact data in the same exact order uh, within Sumo Logic. And as you guys start to dig into this stuff, you'll find there's so many fantastic ways to do different things within Sumo Logic that uh, it, it, gets, it gets to be pretty interesting to see how you can build these queries and come up with the same result in different ways, just to make them a little bit faster. You go to the next result, or the next slide. One of the most common uh, questions we get is, how do we do data correlation? Uh, because we do so much security work for people, and this is such a strong security platform, people always ask us, is this a SIM? And the first thing we say is, this is not a SIM. Right? <laughs> this, this is a data analytics platform that we can use as a SIM, but we have to make sure that we've got all the right rules. So doing uh, data correlations is, is incredibly important. So we've kind of got a real simple flow that we do when we start to build out rules for customers. And the first thing we do is filter, right? That's the metadata and the keywords that you guys have already seen. And then we normalize. Any data scientist will tell you that the majority of the time that they spend looking at data is cleaning and normalizing the data. So data analytics, that's just what it is. So we filter, then we normalize. And the best way to normalize is using the parse at, 
the parse as regex, and then the extract commands. And I'll show you guys examples of all this in a minute. And then from normalize, we filter again. Right? That's where we'll hit the where command that use that operator, or we'll use the is blank. Uh, there's three different ways to use is null, is empty, is blank, depending on what the fields will be. So it's really easy to get rid of data that didn't quite work with your normalization or got pulled in by your filter that you didn't want. And then we aggregate it. Right? How do we count it? How do we sort it? How do we sum it up? And then if you guys get a chance and start to looking at all the really interesting stuff you can do on the math side with Sumo Logic, it's got a full plethora of operators that you can use to do different types of aggregation and, anal and analysis of your data. Now, uh, Mario brought up the field extraction rules. So that's one of the things I wanted to point out. Uh, it is probably the second most important thing to architect when you first jump into Sumo Logic. The first thing you want to do is figure out your source categories, right? How is your language going to be? How are you, what's your syntax? How are you going to use it? Because you're going to leverage the source category information for the rest of your life. The second thing you want to worry about and make sure that you've got a good understanding of is how are you going to leverage the field extraction rules so that you don't have to go through and parse everything, but the data is being pre-parsed, so you're pre-normalizing the data as it comes in. That makes your ability to do correlation across multiple data sets much, much easier. So first thing, always got to start with, what's your naming scheme and your syntax for your source categories? Second thing, think through field extraction rules. How do I use those rules to make normalization much easier? I right, go to the next slide. All right, so let me give you a real example. So this was an actual insider threat for one of our customers. They came to us and they said, we have some, some data that leaked. And we, we're pretty sure we know who it, pro who it is, because this person was recently fired, but we don't know what, we don't know, we don't have any evidence. So we wrote a couple of queries, and I'm going to walk you through the entire query, but first I want to walk you through the example, because this is what we came out to, hey, let's correlate on a couple of things. We want to correlate on time, we want to correlate on this user ID, and then we want to understand what were the actions and the order that those actions happened in. So we're using Sumo Logic to tell a story, right? And that's what's most important when we're talking about incident response. So what did Bob do? If we're looking on the right-hand side, the first thing that he did was he connected to the client VPN. He created a new session, he went through, he got allowed, and it was successful. Then he authenticated to AD, and the next thing he did is, if you look on line six, he added himself to a SharePoint group. In that SharePoint group, he suddenly had access to more. So the uh, Access Directory said, hey, welcome, thank you. You, uh, you now have access to all of that. He added himself to another group. And then he went and he downloaded two sensitive files. So on lines 10 and 11, we can see, hey, he not only added himself to the group, he also went and downloaded these two files. Now, it's really easy for us to add the file names, but because this was an actual customer and I could only change some of the data, I couldn't put all the information in here. But uh, it's really easy to just add files so we know what the files are looking for. And then at the last thing, after he added the group, downloaded the files, we started to look at his Zscaler data, and we went, oh, hey, look, he downloaded the files, and then the first three things he hit were Outlook, Outlook uh, www.outlook.com, mail.live.com, and then the rest of those, the DM, DMX.net, Live.net, Akamai, and Optimizely, uh, and Blue Files are, are all OneDrive components. So they're all uh, cloud storage utilities. So we, built, we, built, we painted a really quick picture of exactly what he did and when he did it. And there's the other thing that I want to show you about this particular thing is when we go through and we normalize all the data, we didn't have time to go through and normalize the VPN timestamps. Normalizing, so we normalized, we had field extraction rules for certain timestamps, but we didn't have them for the Zscaler and the VPN, so we used the message time. So message time is a default field, and if we want to organize our data by message time, that's one way that we can just say, hey, Sumo Logic, tell us when you received this, this, this particular event and organize it by that. Right? So we still put the timestamps in there because we wanted to make sure that we were going the right order, but by organizing by message time, we painted this picture of exactly what this particular individual did, and then we gave them a call and said we need those files back. <laughs> right. The last thing I wanted to point out in this is if we were to look across all of the data for the 24 hours 
uh, there was roughly 249 million events uh, with that in 24 hours. After we did the filtering and we did this particular query, what we are seeing here is an organization of 89 different events painted into a picture of exactly what happened. All right, can I uh, go to the next slide? And here is the magic query, right, that I'm going to show you guys. So uh, back to the, the, the general concept of when we're talking about how do we correlate and paint these pictures, right? We filter, we normalize, we filter again, and then we aggregate. So the first thing we did is we said, hey, here's the source categories we care about. Right? We care about SharePoint. We care about the VPN, we care about Zscaler, and we care about Active Directory. So that, those were our metadata tags. And then we went into our, key, our keywords. So we know the user ID, his name is Bob, right? And then we needed to understand the, uh, the VPN session IDs, because the way the, the VPN session logs worked, if the username wasn't in every log, they would track them through groups of session IDs. So we had to do a quick query for Bob, figure out the session IDs, and then we just tacked it onto the keyword. That limited our data set really well. Now, uh, when we get into the normalize section, there's three things that we use to normalize. There's the parse regex, the parse as, and then the extract. So I'll talk through them all really quickly. I know that Mario already did it kind of once, so I won't bore you with it too much. But in the parse regex, you know, we're going through, we're going, we're starting at a bracket with a colon, and then we're going through some digits, some digits, some strings, and I know Mario said, don't use the, uh, the dot star, but I did. <laughs> but what I did, using that dot star, I'm now pulling out what I'm calling the action, right, from that. And then I've got my anchor data from, from client IP. So that action, that, that particular keyword is getting reused. And that's what we call normalization. As we go through each of these different data types, we filter down into certain keywords that we use across. So you'll see action used across multiple different types of data, whether it was Zscaler or SharePoint or Active Directory, we pulled out an action for each data type so that we had a, a keyword that we could, or a field that we could uh, correlate on. So going into the parse, that's where we said, hey, parse, access policy results, colon, star, anything that is the star is our action field for that particular log type. And then kind of going through, I won't go through each of them, but when we get down into the extract, the extract, we have said, okay, we've got three types that we care about here. We care about the action, we care about the user ID, and we care about the time. So those are the three things that we're going to use across all of these data sets to build our story. And when we get into extract, we said, that was the session ID that I told you guys about. Because uh, the VPN logs don't have the user ID in everything. So what we did is we did an extract of the session ID and then we said, if the session ID matches anything, hit star, right, call it Bob. So we basically added a user ID to all of the logs so that it was easy to correlate them across the board. So that's how we pulled in on those VPN logs by using the, and, and giving them a correlation point of the user ID. So the next thing after we've done our normalization is let's do another round of filtering, right? So first thing we did was, hey, dump everything that's blank in the action field. Because you know what, our parsing wasn't perfect. We were typing fast. So our parsing wasn't perfect. Let's use is blank. And use is blank is the big, I don't know what's in the field. It could be a null, it could be empty, it could be white space. That's the big one. If you, there is also is null and there is is empty. So you can use any three of those. If you don't know what it is, then use is blank, right? So we're dumping anything that we consider to have nothing in the field. And then we said, hey, you know what? For the action matches, we don't care about audit failures because in that, that size of data, we were looking at 24 hours, his, uh, he was disabled from the network, so his Active Directory user was turned off, so there was a lot of audit failures uh, after he left. And then we said, you know what? We already know he accessed the files. We already know that he modified some files and that his phone or his devices were syncing with uh, different things in uh, Office 365. So what we're really looking for is something else. So we're filtering out that data to help tell our story. And then we get down to the aggregate. We say count by message time, which is a default field. Then time, which is one of the things we're trying to correlate on to tell our story. Source category, because we wanted to know where are these things coming from, because we have good source category names. We know it's SharePoint. We know it's the VPN in, the, in Europe. 
we know that it's Zscaler in Europe, and we know that there's another Active Directory server somewhere. So we want to know the source category because our naming scheme tells us where everything is. And then, of course, we need the user ID, and then we want the action. And then to organize it to tell our story, we sort it by the message time, and we want it to be ascending. Right? So show us what happened first, and then go to the end. So we took those 250 million events, turned them into 89 events via parsing or via filtering, then parsed up the things we cared about and told a story in it when we aggregated it. And that's what we were able to give to the leadership and say, we know what he did, we know how he did it, we know when he did it, let's go have that conversation. Okay, go to the next one. All right, so before I start on this one, I'll go ahead and I'll stop for a second. I think there's a few questions. Uh, is uh, Maria, is there anybody who had a question who wanted to, to jump on the call? Uh, I actually have been uh, responding to some of the questions that come online, and what we'll do is at the end, when we have a little bit, we'll just uh, we'll just go over the questions and answers to make sure that everybody gets it. But uh, but yeah, we've Got been it. answering okay. that. Okay, great. All right, perfect. Oh, I just saw one in the chat window. Yeah, no drop. No drop is probably is, is when you're doing the correlation rule. Thank you for bringing it up because I wanted to make sure that I talked about it. What no drop says is it says do this whatever extraction rule it is. Don't stop. If you don't put the no drop uh, keyword in there, what it'll do is it'll stop looking for anything else. So you want to put no drop so it goes to the next thing. Especially when you're working with multiple data sets and we're pulling in Zscaler and Office 365 and you name the other data sources, we want it to scroll through all of them. We've done our filtering, we've got it down to 89 you know, particular logs and that query goes pretty fast because it's only 89 logs now, but we want to make sure that our parsing rules are going through the entire set of 89 um, events. So that's what no drop is for. Thank you for reminding me. All right, last thing that I wanted to show you guys, and this is just for fun, the uh, it's, it's building flow diagram queries. And these things are, are really, really useful. We use them in a lot of different ways with different customers. And the one I'm going to show you here is for it's a checkpoint one. Now it's not particularly well tweaked. This one is in the in the uh, in the community. It's so if you go to the query library, it's already up there. Uh, and you guys can go, you can take it, you can start to tweak it. You definitely want to tweak it by adding stuff into the keywords. So if you look at this one, there were you know, 2.9 million results pulled back when I did this particular query because I didn't do a keyword search. We were just kind of showing you know, how to use this particular query. Uh, but when we go through this, if you look at the way you do a, a flow diagram, what it tells us is it'll actually say, hey, I can tell you exactly, like for checkpoint, when did this particular IP address actually get dropped? Well, we were having some VPN issues, some, some tunnel issues, and we wanted to see what was going on. So we could actually see tunnel things set up, tunnel things set down, IP addresses being accepted on certain access lists, and then we saw them getting dropped. So we could figure out that, hey, the tunnel was coming up correctly, but it was eventually getting dropped, and this is the rule that was dropping it. So shutting up a, a flow diagram query lets us give us a visual picture of how is our data flowing. Now the first thing we need to do to build one of these is we've got to do a parse, right? We want to parse some of the data. And this is a really good example. I, I use this query all the time as an example of how to do stuff, which is one of the reasons we wanted to put it in the uh, in the query library, because the first thing we're looking at is a parse and a subparse. So if you look at parse, we say, hey, parse date colon star, so give me everything that's in that star, our star as date underscore raw and hour. All right, so those are the two fields that we're saying, hey, pull this stuff out. And then what we do is we use the parse regex field. So we've already declared a field that's date underscore raw. And we say, hey, in this field, I'm going to do extra regex parsing, right, just in the field that I just created, that, data, that date underscore raw field. And now I'm going to pull out my day, my month, my year, right? And then I get into an if site, a if statement to try to normalize my time, right? So I'm adding, you know, I'm saying, hey, if the month is January, call it a one, and we go through all the months right there. And that's how we do, we start to normalize our time. And then we concatenate that as the, for the month, the day, and the year, slash the hour, and we call it real time stats. So we take all of that parsing, the sub parsing, the normalization, and we concatenate it into one field called real time stamp. And when you're doing a data flow query, timestamp is incredibly important, right? So we want to make sure that that one is, is well done. So you have to normalize that and spend some time with your timestamps. I will say this, in all of our customers that we've done, 
different types of rules, time is usually one of the biggest issues we run into. Uh, there'll be domain controllers that are, you know, that are floating an hour or two in a different, uh, in a different zone, or they've got different time zones. They've got clock drift. So figuring out those times and normalizing those, it's a lot of the work that we do when we're working with our customers and come back to try to normalize that data. So when you guys are looking at your data and you're not getting the results you're thinking about, if you're using time to organize it, look at your timestamps. Okay, uh, just to kind of go through the rest of this, when we get to the, the more interesting parts to actually build the data flow diagram, they, we get into the identify the fields, right? So we built all these fields in the parsing, which you guys can check later. And we say the fields we care about are real, the real time stamp, the IP, the port, all that kind of fun stuff, all right? And then we say transaction on, and this is actually how we build the flow rule, right? Transaction on the firewall device underscore IP, which is the field that we built with these states. We know that in that particular field, there's gonna be an accept, a deny, a drop, a block, a crypt, an encrypt and a decrypt. And then we say, call that in action taken. And then we wanna organize the results by flow, right? That's the magic. So when you build out all that parsing, you do all that normalization, when you get all that and you identify your fields, the transaction by the transaction on the field in action taken, which is in the field that we just built in the in the regex above, and then we want to organize the results by flow. Then it's just a matter of saying, okay, hey, let's count it out, let's do a max latency, and we're gonna do a from state and a to state, and we built that's how our, our flow diagram came about. All right, so that's that's actually the last slide I have. Uh, and we can uh, take some questions. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll hand it back to Mario for the next deck. Jeff, this is awesome. I think I, I even more because you uh, you just did it for fun, which is even better. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. One of the things, yeah, so I wanna, I just wanna show people um, a little bit of how, how to get a little more information. So uh, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna go through here. Um, of course, most of you have probably gone to uh, to the documentation. Um, Jeff just showed you a lot of pretty cool operators like the transaction operator and a few of these. Uh, what I wanted to show you right now is, uh, actually let me just go here. If you go to our help menu, there is a, there's something called a cheat sheet for operators, which is just fantastic way to start getting familiar with a lot of these operators. So if you go to this cheat sheet, there's one called the search operators cheat sheet. And look at this, it's pretty cool. It shows us all the different operators. actually all the operators broken by what their function is. So for parsing, here's all those different operators that I talked about before. Remember, parse, key value, CSV. If you want to, uh, if you want to aggregate, here's all the different operators that are available to you. And the cool thing is that there's a description, there's an example how to use it, but if you want to know a little bit more about it, just click on it and it's going to take you to show you the exact syntax of how it's done and then how it works and all that good stuff. So by all means, when you get a chance, uh, just go to the cheat sheet for operators and it's gonna become uh, a little easier to use these. All right, so Jeff showed you quite a few uh, fun ones that he's worked with. Uh, what I wanna do is do the exact same thing. This is our community page, and how do you access it? You go in your same environment and you click on community, and it's gonna take you already logged in to this environment. It's gonna be you already logged in in, in there. Um, there's a lot of great information here, how to get started, searches and queries, but today in particular, what I wanted to show you is stuff that is hidden in this query library. Um, Jeff pointed out that there's some of the queries that he built that are already in here for you guys to, to, there you go, looks like Jeff posted something in here. And this is just a wealth of information of queries that are out there, including some that, I, that I'm gonna show you today that I've actually put out there as well. So um, again, how did I get to these queries? I went into topics and I clicked on query library. But the cool thing is that you can also search for that stuff. So let's say for example, that you're looking for something that uses outlier. You can always uh, search for outliers. You get a whole bunch of um, posts out there that are, and here's one of them that I'm, that I'm gonna be showing you in a little bit, how to create meaningful alerts using outliers. So of course there's, too much uh, to, to be able to show you today, but I want to I want to walk you at least through some of these, uh, which I've ordered in a way that I can start showing you from sort of from easy all the way to harder, so you can take some ideas. So let me show you how to how to find these. I'm going to drop in that that code into my environment, and you can see how you can use these templates. So I'm going to search for trends over time first. I'm going to go in here and search for trends 
um, over time, and you'll notice that it pre-populates this stuff, identifying trends over time. There it is. Here is the query itself. It tells you a little bit of how to use it. I'm going to skip all that fun stuff because you're going to read it later on, but I'm literally just copying this. I'm going to go to my environment, and I'm going to drop it into a, uh, into a new tab so you can see how you can place that there, run it. Of course, if your source category is just Apache or Apache Access or Prod Apache Access, you just have to change that. But these queries work really well. In this particular case, I am seeing my status codes of my Apache code uh, of my Apache uh, Access log files broken by time. But this same exact query could be used to look at errors. It could be used to uh, be used for uh, for other things not just status code for your Apache. So this is just a great template that you can use um, to, to look at your data in, uh, in trends over time. You can see that how I can easily start graphing all this and look at trends over time for, in this case, my status codes. All right, um, given that I'm running out of time, let me show you the next one, IP addresses by bandwidth usage. So let me just go search that again into my, into my environment in here. I'm gonna go for IP addresses, um, top 10 IP addresses uh, by time slice. So here is another example. Actually, this wasn't exactly the one I wanted to show you, but that's okay. Here's, a, here's another good one. Um, the one that I, I wanted to show you, the bandwidth one, only because, um, only because it's doing some other operator than count. In this case, it's using sum. So Jeff talked about a whole bunch of math operators that you can use, and sure enough, in this particular case, I'm using one that does a little bit of, uh, of summing my total size. So I can see by my bytes, I sum the bytes by source IPs, and I can see my top IP addresses. All right, let me show you another one that is pretty cool. Um, in this case, this one is, um, let me just remember the name, adding test values. Yeah, I wanted to show you this one because at some point you start creating uh, some queries and you're not really sure how to test your query like you are, are waiting for three hours for some value to come online um, to come in your messages so that you can test it. Let me show you how you can actually add some sample of values into your environment. So let me run this first and this is saying source category equals Apache access limit five meaning just give me five messages and by the way seed this new field called test source IP with this IP address and seed test status code with this IP address and seed this new field with that kind of stuff. But if I actually wanted to seed the actual URL and not the test URL, uh, all I would have to do is say seed URL with this particular value in here. But for now, let's leave it like that. You notice that when I run the query, there are my test fields. And then I can even use this other one here that says, now I only want to display the URL and the test URL fields that are out there. And it's going to run, it's going to show me the message, and it's going to show me the URL and the test URL that, that I can now do additional um, uh, data formatting and massaging with that kind of stuff. All right, some pretty cool ones. What about parsing non-structured fields? This is something actually that Jeff showed you what he was calling it normalizing, but uh, which is actually the, the, correct, uh, the correct way, parsing non-structured fields. If I look for that kind of stuff, here is another example where I don't have a field. Um, let me just make this a little bigger and I don't have to copy it again. But I, don't, I do not have a field uh, called browser, for example. But what I can do is I can take a field that has already been parsed and I can look for keywords in that field and then create myself, if you will, a field called browser, one called IE, one called Firefox, that's going to now store counts that I can then sum up. Um, and keep and, and keep a tab on the different browsers that I'm running the data with. Uh, because we're running out of time, I'm, I'm kind of flying through some of these. Mapping client IP addresses. This is a good one. This one, um, you saw some maps in the uh, in the in the uh, in the apps that I showed you. This one shows you exactly how to do it. Let me just grab this data here, and I'm going to copy and paste it into my environment. So I'm going to open a new tab paste that one in here and you'll notice that it's not probably not going to run and the reason for that is because I do not have a source category of AWS ELB logs but all I have to do is just add it to whatever source category I have which in my case I do have Apache access um, what is key here as well is is my field called client IP or is it called something else in my case I just happen to know that it's called source IP but you can easily find that out by going into your field browser if you guys remember 
um, we ran this this here and I can see down here that my field is called source IP so I can easily run that query by changing those parameters here's my data and then I can map that and see my uh, the geolocations of all the different hits that I'm getting out there um, hmm, my map didn't uh, render for some reason but uh, that's okay there we go all right so here's my map showing you the data um, last but not least I want to leave you with one little one here's a good one that is a good administrative one how are my collectors ingesting data I'll let you search for that one and finding it yourself but I wanted I did want to show you this one this is a great one creating meaningful alerts let me go find that one um, as the last example I'm going to show you but remember there's tons of stuff here that you can uh, that you can um, that you can go and search there. creating meaningful alerts the reason I wanted to show you this one is just awesome it actually helps you identify your 404s in your environment but the great thing about this is that instead of just finding the 404s and let me make my screen a little bit bigger here we go it's saying go find my source category calls Apache access now, since I already parsed through field extraction rule my status code, I can use it right here. As Jeff was showing you, I can, the more I filter, the, the quicker things are going to run. So I can say I only care for status code equals 200 or status code equals 404, which is awesome. I time slice by one minute. And then I say if my status code matches 200 or two something, set it as one. So I'm essentially creating new variables called successes and fails that have a whole bunch of ones and zeros. I can then do a sum. I can take a sum of those successes and create a new field called success count. I can do the same thing for fails. The key thing here is that I'm doing it by time slice, so by every one minute bucket. And then I take it a step further and say, cool, give me a failure rate. Divide my count of fails by my count of successes, which means I end up with a failure rate. And then I can use this really cool operator called an outlier that it's not only going to find me my failure rate, it's going to create standard deviations and all that good stuff. So look at the look at the results in here. I get the success count, I get the fail count, I get the failure rate, but on top of that, that outlier operator that I was talking about in here, build an upper limit, a lower limit, an error rate, an indicator, whatever there's errors, a mean and a standard deviation for me. Let me make my screen a little smaller so you guys can actually um, see all the fields in there. Great. So the cool thing about this is it's easier to explain on a graph. Um, actually, I don't have a lot of variation, unfortunately, right now. Let's let's run this exact same search for 60 minutes instead of 15 minutes. Let's run that. And while that is running, I'm going to go and change my axis to make it something a little more interesting. How about if I go from 0 to, um, to 0 0.05 so that my axis is a little more interesting? Oh, there we go. Uh, 0 0.05 was too small. All right. Just one second as I fumble with this. Um, I'm going to change my axis to 0.1. Okay, so what you're seeing now is this outlier built not only the data points that I wanted and find out where my failure rate is falling, but it also looked at standard deviations. In this case, I chose a threshold of three standard deviations. I wanted to go back five data points each time to figure out what the standard deviation should be. That's why you notice that there's five data points you're missing because it took five data points for it to start identifying what my standard deviation should be. And the really cool thing is it identifies when there's an outlier. If I have data that is out of the norm, it's going to flag it out for me. So from an alert perspective, all you have to do is comment out this line in here because now failure rate indicator is going to be flagged as a one. Let me go back to the data itself. And you know, notice that failure rate indicator is probably going to be flagged as a one whenever I have an error message. So I can now use that as an alert uh, message for that. All right, so I'm going to cut it short here for now. Um, I've, uh, I've shown you some of these ones in here. There's a lot more for you to take a peek at um, if you go to um, Help Community. In, in particular, what I wanted to point you is to that topic called Query Library that is going to show you some of those. Um, I know we're coming to the end of the hour. For those of you who want to stick around, we're more than happy to field questions. I know that there's a few on the uh, on the on the um, on the um, chat in here. So, uh, Maria, I don't know if you want to start fielding some of these questions. Sure thing. Yeah. Um, for for those folks who um, do have to run, I wanted to um, just let you know that we're definitely sending a follow-up to everyone, actually everyone who registered, and we'll send you a recording um, of the session. We'll send you links to all these um, great resources that Mario 
uh, mentioned. And then um, any questions that we don't get through today that came through the chat, uh, we'll, we'll post the, uh, the answers in the community also and include that in the wrap up. Um, and if you have any questions after the session, something, you know, as you dig into it, um, and, and you're like, oh, I wish I could ask Mario, you can. You can ask us in the community, absolutely post your question uh, to the community under Query Library. And I've actually put it in, at the top level um, navigation. So it's, when you head to community.sumologic.com, there it is. Uh, Query Library is right at the very top. All right, without further ado, um, if you have to drop off, please do. But if you want to stick around, we have a couple of questions. Um, that haven't been answered in the chat. Jeff is amazing. He's been answering uh, questions in the chat. Um, so there, there, there are just a couple that haven't been answered yet. Um, so um, Mario, take it away. Yeah, what's the first one? Um, so the first one is, is there an easy way to see all the um, source categories that are current in my environment? Uh, Tom, I just responded to that one and you're seeing on my screen, oh. you can do a star and then count by source category. And you can do the same by any metadata tag. Just keep in mind, you probably don't want to do this for the last 30 days because you're asking for everything, right? Actually, a better way would probably be count distinct or something like that. Uh, um, as a matter of fact, I believe this is one of the queries that is that is in the uh, Sumo Dojo. Cool. Very good. All right, that was easy. Um, the the next question is, um, please show the geomapping example from your dashboard if you have time. Yeah, of course, I'd be happy to. So if you go in here, um, I think I had opened a uh, one of the dashboards. We'll just go into the Apache one and open uh, the dashboard that is in there. So this is opening that dashboard. What you'll notice is that, um, uh, like I mentioned before, every single uh, panel has a query behind it, so I can always click on show and search, as I'm going to do in here. It's going to take me to the search behind it, and there it is. This is the search that is behind that panel. That we're doing source category equals Apache access, then I'm parsing the IP address called client IP. The cool thing is I wouldn't even need this because since I have, a, since I have my field extraction rule already in place, I could I could do without this, but we'll leave it there for now. And it's and the 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 cool one, the one that does all the work is this lookup operator. It says look up latitude and longitude from this service called Geo Default, which is a service that we own and we keep updated, on IP equals client IP. All these other ones, country code, all the way to the end are um are uh optional fields. But the cool thing is that if you look at the data for that, it looks something like this. My latitude, my longitude, country code, and all that good stuff. And if I map it, you saw that it looks something like that. Um, you wanted to do something a little more. Well, what if you want to sort or you only want to, want to see country equals US? You can say country code, I believe was the field, uh, where country code, sorry, where country code equals US. And that's how you can just look at stuff that is particular to the U.S. as well. Cool. Hope that helped. Very good. We also had a question about um, action non-drop and no-drop. I believe it's been answered in the chat, um, but if you're still on and you have more questions, please let us know. Another question um, that we received is, is matches case sensitive? Um, actually, I don't know, but we can test it right away. Um, we, I do believe it's case sensitive because uh, we're asking for an exact match. Um, actually, it is. I just got confirmed that it is, so match is case sensitive. But you can always do something like, let's say that I was looking for the word get, um, get star. So you can always do where source IP matches that or where source IP matches and then do get with lowercase. So match is case sensitive, but you can always use an or. Um, I saw another question also about this two number in here. You don't have to use it. You can use a, a dash. Um, the, the, the reason I like to show people the two is because if you're doing something like minus 45M to uh, 30M, that says from minute 35 to minute, from minute 45 to minute uh, 30, some people might get confused that this dash is just like an in-between to, to the other one. So, Usually, I like to just point out the two to make it easy for people to understand, but not necessary. Cool. All right, I think we've cranked through all the um, written questions. I'm going to unmute. Uh, so if you guys um, have a question. Oh, 
there's another question. Can we get uh, regex and keywords? Can we give regex in keywords? I'm not sure I'm understanding your question, Andrew. Can we give regex in keywords? All right, I just I just unmuted everyone. So, um, Andrew, if you're still on, if you can ask your question again. Hey, Andrew, if you wanna uh, if you wanna ask the question, you're welcome to. All right, he may have dropped off, um, so we'll we'll maybe follow up. Oh, there's um, Andrew just typed. Instead of uh, passing error as a keyword, can I pass a uh, regex? Oh, I see. Can the regex expression be part of the keyword? Um, no, the the answer is no. You would you would um, the first thing that you do is you filter the data. If you remember that diagram that Jeff was putting, that you filter data, then you do something to it. So. Your keyword is essentially doing that. It's, it's looking for, in this case, the word Mario itself. Um, so, the, so the first thing is you you search on keywords, you search on metadata, and then you can start doing any parsing that you want on that. Okay. Yeah, and just to expand on that, you can you can use wildcards. So if you wanted to do Mario Star, you get everything sure. that had to do with Mario. Yeah. So you could do. Oops, I'm I was typing in way and not doing it. But you could do something. And fail star and in that case it's going to catch fail failure uh, failures fails and all that good stuff and you notice that the end is implicit so this is the exact same thing um, the or would be explicit of course oh, all right all right so um, I think we're caught up in the with the questions in the chat if anyone um, everyone's unmuted so if you have a question and want to um, speak off um, right now is a good time Yes, after, after it's validated from Conquer, then it will hopefully send an email to you. Hopefully. I, I think that's just a comment okay, outside yeah. of the conversation. Okay. If you're not speaking, please um, please put yourself on mute so um, we don't get the background noise. Excellent. It sounds like uh, we covered the questions. Jeff, I send you a virtual high five from here. Thank you for helping us with this and sharing your insights with the uh, with the community. Absolutely, Jeff, Mario, yeah, you guys absolutely. did an you guys did an amazing job, and um, so thank you for for being so insightful and helpful. Um, everyone on the call, thank you also for attending and for your great questions. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be sending a follow up. Um, so you have the great queries at your disposal um, and the answers to your questions um, as well. So uh, with that, um, we are off to the races. So happy querying, um, and uh, we'll, we'll chat with you soon. We'll also send um, a survey. So let us know um, how we did. Let us know how we can improve for the future. And also, we want to um, start doing these types of workshops on a regular basis, so please let us know what are some other topics you'd like to see covered, or if you would like to see another query workshop, uh, go deeper into some things, um, expand a little bit, or if you want to talk about collectors, or whatever it is that's on your mind, please let us know, and we'll look forward to doing these in the future. With that, we're off, uh, Andrew, looks but like you have one last we question. do have one more question from Andrew. Please. Andrew, if you're still on. I think Andrew is typing. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Everyone else, um, if you want to drop off, uh, please go ahead. But if you want to stick around for Andrew's question, you are free to do so as well. Thanks so much. Andrew, it must be a hard question because you're thinking hard about it. Hopefully you don't stump us. <laughs> the question is, I'm getting a lot of lines in a given message and the keywords are not being highlighted. All right, so I'm guessing, Andrew, that uh, what you're talking about is if I search for this, the word, um, Mozilla, uh, oops, if I spell it correctly, and I hit enter, 
Um, I'm expecting the word Mozilla to actually be, uh, wow, that's interesting, and uh, Mozilla. You're expecting the, the word Mozilla to actually be highlighted, correct? Let me see my screen here. I'm going to go over to the right-hand side, um, like so. So what you're saying is that in your case, your, um, your message is not getting highlighted with yellow, even though the keyword is in there. Is that, I assume, is that correct? Um, yes. Okay. Um, so the only thing I can think of right now is that perhaps it's some, we've been playing lately with the format that we display the messages down here. For example, if you send us a JSON format, we're working on recognizing that JSON format and displaying the message, the raw message instead of just a string, displaying in JSON format. So I'd love to take this offline and, and kind of see what your particular use case happens to be. And I can I can see what what it is if it's if it's a feature if it's an enhancement or something we have to do I'd love to hear from you if that's okay Andrew. Yeah, Andrew, actually, if you can post your post your query in the community, then we then we can all try it too. Uh, I I've seen the same issue when I thought I was actually looking for a particular word but because I missed a a a, a comma or a, a a colon or something that it actually wasn't searching for it. So if you post the query, then we can all just kind of double check it. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. That's a good one. So Tapan has another question. He says, I tried the geo mapping query. Um, I can see the IP. The geo icon is also highlighted, but the map is not displayed. So I'm guessing, um, fortunately, I was running that earlier. Let me see where it is, visitor locators. Um, so I'm guessing I'm going to simplify this just to make it a little easier and uh, get rid of the extra stuff in here. Um, I'm guessing, I'm guessing Tapan, that what you're doing is you're running something like this. Um, you're doing a sort, you probably get results um, like this. So it sounds like you have these results, your latitude, your longitude, and you have a count. Um, and But your error is that when you click on this, it's not showing you the um, the map itself. Is that is that correct? Um, yes. Okay. Huh. Uh, the first thing that I would check is, are you actually getting? Um, the, yeah. The first thing that I would check is, hold on. Let me just get rid of this stuff here. Um, are you actually, when you have these values, do you actually get latitudes and longitudes? Because if you don't, it's possible that your IP address that you're pulling out is an internal IP address. And in that case, of course we cannot check those IP addresses against our database because we don't know about them. They might be internal. So first thing I would do is check your, that your IP addresses are internal in case you have two different IP addresses on your, on your data. Um, sure, no problem. And again, feel free to post on, uh, on community. I would be more than happy to look at those of uh, your particular use case as well. Right. Cool. All right, very well. I think I think that's it. So, um, if you guys have any questions uh, following this, or as if more questions arise as you dig in, um, this is not the end. If there is need, we'll do more of these. We can see each other again. Uh, but definitely in the community, uh, we're always there. So just um, post away, and we'll be there to answer your questions. Um, so thanks again, and we um, hope that you enjoyed our last hour as much as we did. Um, so thanks for all the great questions. And uh, see you guys soon. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm.